Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Well, if we can grow to the point where in trials and tribulations or even in tragedies, things that are so unbelievably painful and things that are unfair and that we don't understand and we can still never even be tempted to say, well, God, don't you love me? That's a victory. Now, emotions can keep people out of the will of God, but somebody was talking to me yesterday, it was actually my daughter, and she likes to ask me what I'm going to be teaching, and then I told her what I was going to be teaching. She said, well, what do you do to control your emotions? How would you tell somebody to control their emotions? Well, the first thing I would tell you is any time the devil is after you, you can immediately interrupt the devil's plan by praying. Amen. It's just the simplest little thing. You just pray. Or sometimes when the devil lies to you, all you got to do is confess the scripture out loud. He goes away. He don't want to listen to you preach to him. He's not in here tonight. He doesn't like to hear preaching. Amen? Amen. But you can preach to yourself. So the first thing you do, you feel jealous, you feel offended, you feel angry, you pray. God, I don't want to feel like this, but until the feelings go away, I'm asking you to help me control myself. I want to glorify you and not give in to this. I need your strength. I'm not wanting to send you home to try <laughs> to change or to try to not feel certain ways. I'm, I'm trying to tell you that you're always going to have certain feelings. You never know exactly when they're going to show up. You never know exactly when they're going to go away. So we need to learn to enjoy the good ones and resist the bad ones. I love it when I feel like doing everything I'm supposed to do, but I've made my mind up. Can somebody say, I've made my mind up? <laughs> that I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do, whether I feel like doing it or not. Now, some of you, I mean, for some of you, this is going to be like a radical lifestyle shift. Because I can tell you, when you're used to doing everything you feel like and giving in to your feelings, it is tough when you start trying to change. Let me tell you what, I had some strongholds in my flesh from the way I was raised, and mmm, honey. Whew. When I started trying, even remotely trying to be a submissive wife and keep my mouth shut and not argue with Dave. I mean, the war in my flesh was like World War III. But I'm still here, and God gave me the victory. Amen? Right away, pray, it interrupts the devil. Then, if you're having a consistent problem with something, study the Word of God in that area because there's power in the Word to change things. The Word is powerful, powerful. There's power in every Word of God that I'm speaking to you tonight. It's full of power. It has inherent power in it, and it can change you. The Word of God changes us. I mean, I, I sat down one day and I quickly found 40 things that the Word of God does for us. 40. And you can find almost all of them in Psalm 119. The Word of God keeps us from sin. <laughs> the Word of God protects us. The Word of God energizes us. The Word of God changes us. <laughs> So don't ever look at your Bible like, well, you know, I better read my chapter today. I don't want God to be mad. <laughs> God doesn't need you to read the Bible. He knows it. <laughs> he wants us to study for ourselves because we need it. We need to be educated. Now, there's going to be times in our life when God himself is going to test our emotions. Hmm. Now, what happens when you test something? 
Well, it means that you just put a little pressure on it to see if it's the real deal or not. <laughs> have you ever bought a chair without sitting on it? No, have you ever bought a mattress? Turn your right side, turn your left side, you lay on your back, you lay on your stomach, then you go try all the other ones. Psalm 7, verse 9. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the uncompromisingly righteous, those upright and in harmony with you. For you, talk about God, who try the hearts and emotions and the thinking powers are a righteous God. So how would God try us in an area? God may not remove an emotion that we don't like as soon as we would like him to because he wants us to learn how to live beyond that feeling. We may want to feel God's presence, but he might hide. Have you ever gone through seasons in your life where you thought, I, wherever you're at, I don't know where it is. Listen, I remember when I was a baby Christian, baby Christians can get, can get by with stuff. I mean, I remember when I would need a word from God, I would just do one of these things. <laughs> Come on, be honest, how many of you have done that? Look at that, everybody in here. One of my granddaughters heard me say this the other day. She's like, I've got one that's 15 and one that's 17. And even the 15 year old just laughed her head off. She said, I've done that. <laughs> I've done that. Well, you know, for a while it worked. It was amazing. <laughs> I mean, I would go to David and say, you are not gonna believe this. I prayed and asked God this question and this is what I opened up to and pointed to. And even Dave would be impressed and that takes a lot. You gotta be kidding. I'd like, wow, isn't it awesome? <laughs> well, but then it got concerning when I would try that and I would get, woe be unto you, you wicked sinner. Ooh. <laughs> Let's try again. Well, see, God may give us confirmations and signs and wonders and all kinds of emotional stuff in the beginning stages of our walk with him, but he's not going to let us live off that forever because he wants us to learn to not live by sight, but by faith. You know, I don't. I don't really ever sit around anymore and ask myself when I pray or spend time with God, do I feel God's presence? <laughs> now I did. I can remember when Dave and I were in like these amazing church services and I would just, oh, I mean, I would just be the anointing, the presence of God would just be overwhelming. And we would leave sometimes and I'd say to Dave, did you feel the presence of God tonight? He said, no. <laughs> I thought, what is wrong with you? <laughs> See, I didn't realize that he was actually more spiritually mature than I was because he wasn't sitting there asking himself how he felt. He already believed that God was there. <laughs> Come on. And how many times do we assume that somebody's not spiritual because they're not feeling what we're feeling? <laughs> Man, we can get off into some silly stuff. Ooh, there's, look at that, my hand's shaking, it's God. I mean, you know, I, something like that, I guess, could be God. I mean, I remember Oral Roberts saying that he would feel the power of God in his right hand when he prayed for the sick. But the good news is, is I am so glad that I don't have to base what I believe on what I feel because my feelings come and go and change, but God never changes and he never goes. He's always with us.
And you never have to feel bad if you're in a church service or in a prayer group or something and everybody seems to be feeling all kinds of stuff and you don't feel nothing. And I know that's hard. I mean, I've, I've had to try to counsel people through that kind of stuff. Well, I never feel like I don't know. <laughs> Job 19, 25 and 26. My, my, my. This is shouting ground right here. For I know that my Redeemer and Vindicator lives. Now, Job had had a bad day, to say the least. A bad few days, maybe a bad few months. Nobody in the Bible seems to have had it as bad as Job did. I mean, his wife said, curse God and die. His friends were against him. And he said, and I want to read you, verses 25 and 26, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last, the last one, he will stand upon this earth. Now look at verse 26. And after my skin, even this body has been destroyed, then from my flesh or without it, I shall see God. Wow. He didn't say I feel, he said I know. I know. Paul said, my determined purpose is to know him and the power of his resurrection. I mean, I, listen, I admit feelings are awesome. I felt a strong presence of the Lord here tonight and last night in our worship, and, and that's great. But if I didn't feel, I still know. And to be honest, now listen to me, when you know that you know, that you know, that you know. I don't think you can really even tell the difference between what you know and what you feel because you're not, you're not basing anything on what you feel. You already know. I know God loves me. Romans 8, 35 through 39. One of the most important things for you to know is that God loves you and he is never going to stop. Matter of fact, can I tell you something? And this is always kind of shocking to people. God will never love you any more than he does at this moment right now. You say, well, won't he love me more when I do better? <laughs> God's love is not based on our behavior. It's based on who he is and he is love. Well, if he won't love me anymore, then why should I try to be good? <laughs> because you love him. Not to get him to love you, but because you love him. Boy, if we can grow to the point where in trials and tribulations or even in tragedies, things that are so unbelievably painful and things that are unfair and that we don't understand and we can still never even be tempted to say, well, God, don't you love me? That's a victory. Amen. Who shall ever separate us from Christ's love? Somebody who's hurting in this place tonight needs to get this. Who shall ever separate us from Christ's love? Shall suffering and affliction and tribulation or calamity and distress or persecution or hunger or destitution or peril or sword? Even as it is written, for your sake, we are put to death all day long. We are regarded and counted as sheep for the slaughter. I love that. You can be talking about a, being a Christian and your circumstances may, you may be in a season in your life where your circumstances are so bad that to other people you look like a sheep being led to the slaughter. Yet in the midst of all these things, we are more than conquerors. Wow. Right in the middle of them. They are, we are more than conquerors. How? And we gain a surpassing victory through him who loved us. Victory comes through knowing that God loves you. And that no matter what you go through on this earth, at the last day, you will see your Redeemer alive and you will stand with him.
I am persuaded beyond doubt, I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things impending and threatening, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate me from the love of God which is found in Christ Jesus. Awesome. You know, for those of you that are watching this by television, let me just say to you personally, God loves you. And he wants you. He wants to have a personal, intimate relationship with you. He wants to come into your life and flood your life and fill you with his presence and teach you how to live a life that will be worth living. And if you have not received Christ as your Savior, there's a number on your screen that you can call right now, and somebody that works with me will tell you about how you can be born again, and if you're sincere and you want a new life, they will pray with you, and God will begin a work in your life that will make you a totally different person. So please call. Let us help you. God loves you. Let's not live by how we feel. Let's live by what we know. Everybody say, I know. I know. Now just one last thought or so that I wanna share with you. Watchman Nee also said, he who lives by emotions will live without principle. Principle is an accepted rule of action or conduct. It's a standard that we live by. Do you have a standard for your life? Have you drawn a line somewhere and said, I will not do those things. I will do these things. I will not do those things. Well, some of you, I guess, aren't sure. I don't know. <laughs> do you wait for your friends to tell you what kind of movies you're going to go see? Or will you stay home alone if it's either that or be offensive to the Holy Spirit? See, I've made a few decisions for my life. I'm not going to waste another day of my life being angry. I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> I will be generous. I will fight greed and selfishness by being aggressively generous. I have a standard for my life. I will meet needs. I will give the Word of God first place in my life. I will finish my race. By the grace of God, I will. We do nothing without Him, but we can do everything through Him. But you gotta make a decision. Colossians 3 says, set your mind and keep it set. Don't set your mind and then change it when it gets hard. Is this helping anybody tonight? Yeah. He who lives by emotion will live without principle. That means he will live without integrity. Now this is sad, but we've done like, sometimes they do these, what they call man on the street interviews, and when I'm gonna teach on something, they'll go out and just ask random people questions. You would be shocked at how many people today don't know what integrity is. You can ask them what's integrity, and they're like, I don't know. That is sad. That's actually frightening. Because a person of integrity is an honest person, they tell the truth at all times. They keep their word. They do what they say they're going to do. And if they can't, they don't just ignore their commitment. They communicate. They don't buy a pair of shoes and when they get home find out they accidentally gave them two pair and just decide God's trying to bless them and they keep them. <laughs> God, they're going to bless you by stealing from somebody else. Thank you. 
integrity. 35 years ago when God told us to step out, well, it's, no, it's 30 years ago, when God told us to step out, we'd done five years of home Bible studies, five years I worked for somebody else, and now God said, I want you to go north, south, east, and west. And he said, "There's put in my heart, there's three things I want you to do. If you do them, I'll bless you. Keep the strife out of your life. Do what you do with excellence, and always be a person of integrity. So integrity is very important to me, and I hope it's something that's important to you. And if you don't know what it is, then I strongly suggest that you study it and find out. Keep your word. When you tell people that you're going to do something, do it. If you tell somebody you're going to call them back, call them back. Amen. The word integrity means the state of being whole or undivided. You know what that means? Your conscience agrees with your actions. We're not doing one thing while our conscience is telling us that we shouldn't be doing it. There's nothing worse than continuing to do something that you know that you shouldn't be doing. Boy, you talk about something that makes you uncomfortable. That's it. To believe in your heart that your actions are right. Now, I want to close here by just going through a few scriptures with you. We're just going to read them. I want you to see how important integrity is in the Word of God. Proverbs 25, 26. Like a muddied fountain and a polluted spring is a righteous man who yields, falls down, and compromises his integrity before the wicked. If we're out in the world where wicked people are and we are not walking in integrity, he says you're like a polluted spring. Proverbs 20, verse 7. The righteous man walks in his integrity. Now to get this, here comes the, the payoff. Blessed, happy, fortunate, enviable are his children after him. <laughs> Give your children an inheritance of integrity. Teach them to be people of integrity. Teach them to be honest. Teach them to be excellent. All four of our children have a strong sense of this is important to do. Psalm 101, 2. I will behave myself wisely and I will give heed to the blameless way Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house in integrity and with a blameless heart. I love that scripture. He's saying, I'm going to do what's right when nobody's looking. When I'm at home behind closed doors, I'm going to do what's right because I'm living for God, not people. Just a couple of more. Psalm 26, 1. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. <laughs> I have expectantly trusted in, leaned on, and relied on the Lord without wavering, and I will not slide. Now Job, chapter 2, verse 3. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on all the earth? A blameless and an upright man who reverently fears God and abstains from and shuns all evil because it is wrong. And still he holds fast his integrity, although you moved me against him to destroy him without a cause. Everything that Job went through, he still held fast to his integrity. Now we talk about poor old Job, but you need to read all the way to the end of the book because in the end, Job ended up with twice what he had before. Doing what is right is extremely important. Even though you might not yet be getting a right result, continue to do what's right because your reward will definitely come. I want to close with Revelation 22, 12. Right at the very, very end of the Bible. Behold, I am coming soon.
and I shall bring my wages and rewards with me to repay and render to each one just as his own actions and his own work has merited. Behold, I'm coming soon, and I'm bringing my reward and my wages with me. Let me tell you something, payday's coming. And for those of you who are doing what is right, even when it's hard and you're persistent, if you never get a right result here on this earth, he's coming again and he's going to bring his wages and his rewards with him. Don't live for today, live today for eternity. Well, now remember, no matter what we feel like doing, we should decide to run our race believing God's word is the truth and learn to follow him. Extreme poverty is a huge problem in this area just outside of Hyderabad, India. But there are two young girls that we want to tell you about. Their names are Bhavana and Nandini, and they are facing something that is so difficult. The fact is, they are girls, and that's basically all it takes. My name is Nandini, I'm studying in fourth class. I have nine years old. My name is Priya Bhavana, I'm studying in ninth class. Uh, I, I am uh, 14 years old. 14 years old. What kind of problems are, are your family facing? My father is not there in my home. He is swimming outside. I have a lot of problems. 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 God is taking care of you. Yes, uh, God is taking care about me in all my uh, necessities and He is giving me very good help. Then what do you like to do together? Uh, we will pray together every day and we'll pray, play every day. Whenever we have time, we'll make funny jokes, we'll sit, uh, study, and we'll learn about God. What does it mean to you when you come here to visit and you see your daughters are happy? As I'm sure you know, there are many parts of the world where simply being born a girl and not a boy makes life very difficult. India is one of those places. Together we can make a difference, and we are. The girls that you see behind me are part of our Hand of Hope sponsored children's home. And we're able to not only keep them in a safe place, an environment that is loving, but to let them know that what society says about them is not true, that it's what God says about them that matters. They are valuable and they are loved. You are helping make this possible. Don't ever look at a situation and think it's too big to make a change. Together, we are making a change, and we thank you for being part of it. De zon gaat op en de wereld is mooi. Stormopkomst. Laat je niet door je gevoelens leiden. Joyce Meyer laat je zien hoe het anders kan. In haar boek Emoties in Balans. Bestel het boek Emoties in Balans nu via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100.